Hi everyone, this is lecture 4.1, Culture. The main points we will hit on in this lecture are what exactly culture is and what are the components of culture. So culture is composed of the beliefs, norms, behaviors, and products uh, common to the members of a particular group. Uh, culture is also influenced by our social development. I, I'm sorry, I missaid that. Culture also influences our social development. Thus, uh, because we are uh, creatures as humans who are very much subject to uh, the social environment that surrounds us, we are very much products of our cultural beliefs, behaviors, and biases. A lot of the reason why you do things the way, sorry, a lot of the way, reason you do things the way you do is uh, because you learned how to do it that way in cultural way that you do them. Uh, the reason you like the foods you like, the reason maybe you have some of the uh, attitudes, including political attitudes that you have, may be due to uh, your social surroundings. Culture includes language, standards of beauty, hand gestures, uh, styles of dress, food, and music. It's important to emphasize that culture is learned. It is passed from one generation to the next through communication, not through genetics. You learn to like what you like based on what you are exposed to. It doesn't have to do with blood or the food that people uh, of certain groups naturally eat. Uh, a lot of times when people talk that way, they say, I grew up in a heavily Italian area. Uh, and a lot of Italian people around me said things like, well, of course I love spaghetti. Uh, it's yeah, I'm Italian. Well, a lot of those people make that uh, assertion that it's somehow a genetic thing because they are therefore Italian. Well, no, you that person would love spaghetti because that's what their mother or grandmother made them growing up, right? They learned that behavior from loved ones. It was not actually genetic. I point that out because uh, sometimes when uh, racist pseudoscientists scientists uh, i.e. Uh, Nazis, or groups that uh, commiserate with them. They like to portray their uh, hate through um, pseudoscientific, pseudo-genetic uh, arguments. And those, those, those simply are not true. Now let's talk about ideal culture versus real culture. The idea culture the ideal culture of a given group are the values, norms, and behaviors that people in a given society profess to embrace, right? So these are the ideas that we think are really good ideas. These are what we think the ideal ideas that people should have in society are. But the real cultural attitudes are the values, norms, and behaviors that people exhibit in a given society and actually embrace actually exhibit. So we may say, well, people believe beauty is only skin deep. And that sounds like a good idea. But the real culture of it is that we do have attitudes of what uh, attractiveness are, right? That we and what we think is beautiful and uh, how we treat beautiful people. People that are really attractive get treated better in society. That is a matter of real, real culture. While we at least ideologically, many of us believe that people should be treated different, should be treated the same, no matter what we look like. And those contradictions between ideal culture and real culture are called cultural inconsistencies. So that just the difference between those two things. Let's talk some about components of culture. So culture consists of two different categories. We have material culture. Uh, i.e. the stuff around us, the physical materials in our society. So uh, our houses, our clothes, uh, our cars, our backpacks, our pencils, all of those are material culture. And then we have symbolic culture, sometimes called non-material culture. These are ideas, language, cultural understandings. These are the ideas to our society. Uh, it's the stuff that isn't physical. And here are uh, a number of other uh, components of culture. 
Uh, signs or symbols are things like traffic signals. So a red light, a product logo, so like a McDonald's or a Taco Bell sign. These are used to meaningfully uh, represent something else. Signs are often represented via material culture. So they're actually physical stuff. Uh, however, uh, gestures are signs that we make with our body. So these are facial expressions, uh, motions we make with our hands, ways we hold our bodies. These are, called, these are gestures. And these are often uh, categorized via symbolic culture. Finally, uh, language is a system of communication using vocal sounds, gestures, and written symbols. So literally the stuff that's coming out of my mouth and the words that you're seeing in front of you and your screen, that's what we mean by language, and those are all highly symbolic. Uh, and when understanding us as humans, uh, language is probably the single most significant component of culture because it's what allows us to communicate with each other. And that's a really powerful thing. I uh, am recording this on a day that is not the same day as when you're hearing this, right? So that message is being transported not only by uh, time, but also space, because I'm in a different place where you are. Uh, that's an intensely powerful tool that we have to convey complex ideas that other uh, animals uh, simply don't have. It, which is, you know, it's kind of a mind blower, but we take it for granted as humans. The superior wharf hypothesis is a specific uh, theoretical idea in sociology that language structures thought and the ways that we look at the world. So we often think of our thoughts, and this is actually really take this into consideration because this is one of the big, big ideas in sociology. Sapir Whorf stated, these, those are two, two people's last names, Sapir and Whorf, that language structures thought. Don't we typically think that thought structures action, right? The way we think of it is you think about eating a hamburger and then you talk about it. Then you order a ham. I would like a hamburger, right? Sapir so Wharf would argue that you know the word for hamburger, thus you would want a hamburger, right? Um, so you probably aren't craving, for example, a food that you don't have the words for, or uh, you might not. Um, you might not even have emotions, words for emotions that exist in the human experience, but that you don't have words for, right? Um, it, it's, a, it's a big, it's a big, really abstract idea. Effectively, the words that you have in your language dictate how you experience the world. It's really interesting. A really simple example of this is that people in colder climates have more words for snow and more descriptive words for uh, winter weather than people that live in normal climates. I have experienced this actually when I've traveled to New Mexico. Um, you guys have a really different de definition of snow than what uh, we have uh, where I live. Um, I've heard snow be, the, the stuff on your car be referred to as snow. It might have just been the person that I was listening to. It's like, it's not snow, we caught, that's frost. Uh, at least where I live, that's what that's called. It might be where you live. I, I think that's a fair observation, though. Um, and where my wife grew up, Erie, Pennsylvania, they get loads and loads and feet and feet of snow. And they, they have so much snow that sometimes they don't even, like, even talk about it uh, in the winter because, well, it's simply not notable. It's just every day part of their life. Um, that's an example of your work hypothesis. Values and norms are another major component of culture. Values are shared beliefs about what a group considers to be worthwhile or desirable. Norms are the formal and informal rules regarding what kinds of behavior are acceptable and appropriate within a culture. Values 
And if I were writing this in, on a board in front of you, I would write values, draw an arrow, and then draw that arrow to norm, right? Values are the basis of our norms. They dictate what we decide our, norm, our, our norms are. So values are our beliefs. Norms are the rules, right? So you form rules based on what you believe. And there are many types of norms. A folkway is one type of norm. It is a loosely enforced norm that involves common customs, practices, or procedures that ensure smooth social interaction and acceptance. Before starting or ending, it looks like they're ending there, uh, that tennis match, ending a um, athletic event, you shake hands to show, hey, no hard feelings, whatever, right? Uh, another a more crude example is uh, if you're in an elevator with another human being, you don't fart in the elevator, right? That's intensely rude, right? You wouldn't, no one's getting in prison, thrown in prison for farting in the elevator, but you might give the person a, a look, right? You, or you might not say anything at all because folkways are, uh, these are our, um, manners their politenesses it's not a big deal when people break those things but we think people aren't uh, very kind when they do a more than more not more a more is a norm that gathers greater moral significance is closely related to the core values of the group and often involves severe repercussions for violators mores are norms that we think are very important to follow Mores, sorry, yeah, mores are typically backed up by the law. So an example of that, we value human life and we have many norms that about when violence is acceptable and when it is not acceptable. In day-to-day -day culture, most of the times violence is not acceptable. And murder is something we think is especially bad. It is a violation of a more to commit murder. And there are also laws that back that up. Now, a more that does not, is not backed up by the law in our society, at least within most of our society, are ideas surrounding adultery, right? We think that if you are married to somebody that you should not be having affairs or having sexual relations with people who are not your spouse in general. I know there are exceptions to those rules. So if you cheat on your spouse, that is the violation of a more, but is not a violation of the law because it's not against the law to cheat on your spouse. Uh, it, it might strike you as something that's wrong, but no one, you can't get thrown in prison in the United States for uh, cheating on your spouse. A taboo then is an incredibly intense more. It is a norm ingrained so deeply that even thinking about violating it evokes strong feelings of disgust, horror, or revulsion. This is the strongest of norms. Uh, the type of norms that we feel uncomfortable talking about uh, and that's because they're so intense and we see them as so wrong. Examples of these include necrophilia. So sex with a corpse. That is some, the violation, that kind of violation uh, is deeply, deeply gives us the willies, right? Uh, cannibalism is similarly taboo. Child molestation. Uh, that is a very taboo, incredibly um, strong norm in our society. And child molestation really drives home the strength of the taboo that when someone violates a taboo, we often are driven to want to hurt the person that does that thing. Um, yeah, and that, that's that. Now, we have, how do we enforce these mores, these norms, these are our, our collective values. We have these things called sanctions. Sanctions are both positive or negative. These are the re reactions that we give to people when they either follow or disobey norms. And it includes rewards for conformity and punishment for violators. So 
uh, often when we talk about sanctions, we're talking about negative sanctions. So they, these are things that we do to people when they break the rules. So you murder someone, we throw you in prison, we might execute you, right? That is a negative sanction. But there also are positive sanctions. Positive sanctions are um, uh, things like you save somebody's life, we give you a medal, or uh, you win an award, or you hold a door open for an old lady. She might give you the positive sanction of saying thank you, right? Sanctions also apply to folkways. Sanctions help us establish social control, which are the formal and informal mechanisms used to increase conformity to values and norms and increase social cohesion. So the way a big component of how we hold society together, how we hold these rules of politenesses or not getting thrown in prison are this component of sanctions. So they are actually very important to our society. Okay, that's it for uh, this lecture, not as long as some. Uh, there uh, will probably be one following this. And if you have any questions, uh, as always, please let me know.